Okay, so we're here with Dr. Fogel. And Hi. Dr. Fogel, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing well. Um, and uh, I was curious to see, first of all, um, how do you like teaching at SDSU? I love teaching at San Diego State. It's <laughs> fun. I've been doing it for 12 years now. And I love being around inner, inner, uh, energetic, uh, interdisciplinary kids, uh, young, young, young people, no longer kids uh, that, that are actively interested in learning. And I try to enthuse them with aerospace engineering. That's awesome. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, can you give us like a quick little rundown of um, how'd you get into model airplanes as, as uh, someone as awesome as you? <laughs> sure, sure, no problem. <laughs> uh, there was no choice for me. I had a dad that was in aerospace engineering, and at an early age, like of two, I was already doing model airplanes, uh, mainly the free flight, kind of just throw the glider and it kind of goes on its own. Uh, got into model rockets as a kid, um, middle schoolish, uh, and then RC, uh, RC gliders mainly, uh, solo when I was nine at a Detroit Pines Glider Port here in San Diego. And I've been doing that ever since. Uh, powered models, RC cars, RC boats, RC sailboats, model rockets, and free flight gliders. That's awesome. Yeah, that's fun. amazing. Yeah. And um, also, I was curious about um, how'd you write the book? How'd you write the book that's on the website of Tory Pines Gliderport? Yeah. So back, um, I'll try to keep it short, but uh, back in the 80s, uh, so sorry, the Torrey Pines Glider Report has an amazing history that I'm sure we'll get into. But back in the 80s, uh, there was a threat of having that Glider Report be developed upon uh, by UC San Diego. And as they own half of the property uh, and the San Diego City owns the other half, uh, there was debate about whether or not the Glider Report would still exist if, if there was buildings on it. So my father and I were adamant to at least try to do something about that and went to the city of San Diego to get it listed as a, as a historic site. That required doing a lot of research about what had actually happened out there because I didn't know much about it uh, going in. And all of that research ended up leading to it becoming a city historic site just for the city portion because the city doesn't have jurisdiction over the state property. Uh, we got it listed on the state register of historic places that includes the entire glider port and then also on the national register of historic places, the first glider port in America to have that honor. And so because of all that legwork and all the effort to demonstrate the history of that place, I compiled that into a book called Wind and Wings, which came out in 2000, I think it is, and was reprinted in 2001 or 2002. It's out of print now, but it's available at the Glider Port, and um, I still just do copies left. That's amazing. That's amazing. Thank you very much for this for this uh, amazing um, accomplishment, by the way, yeah, the fact that, that this, awesome. this historic yeah. site is, is you're doing. Yeah, it's totally fine. And it was a lot of fun to interview a lot of the pioneers that had flown there in 1930s and 40s as a part of that research. They were still alive. And so I tried to capture as much of that as I could. I didn't have YouTube at the time. Would have been great. Uh, but I tried to capture that into words and then put their words in the book. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so tell us what you know about the the early days of Tory Pines and how it came into fruition in the in the 1930s and such. Sure, 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 sure. It was through people like yourself. So um, at that time in the 1920s, going into the 1930s, 1920s, we had here in San Diego a fantastic interest in aviation. There had already been a Navy aviation facility for some time, but there was a lot of local interest around Charles Lindbergh's flight in 1927. That aircraft was built here in San Diego, and it was built by a gentleman in part uh, named Holly Bolas. Uh, Holly Bolas was the superintendent of construction on the Spear of St. Louis. And, Bolas himself was also a very big glider fan. Uh, and right after that uh, historic achievement, he started building his own series of gliders here in San Diego in like late 1928 into 1929 and into 1930. Uh, those gliders were very, very high performance gliders for the time. He was able to set some uh, endurance records at, off the coastline at Point Loma, off the hillsides there for national records for gliding endurance not just a few minutes, but hours, like nine hours long flight in a, in a sailplane in 1929, 1930, which were amazing accomplishments. Um, the Lindberghs, Charles and Ann Lindbergh, were so amazed by that, they came back to San Diego specifically to learn how to fly gliders from Holly Bolas and got very interested in it. And now because the Lindberghs were back in town, all the young people in San Diego were very interested in getting into gliders because that was the cool thing. So in local high schools in San Diego, the woodshop teachers weren't building chairs for their students or desks. They were building gliders. 
and the kids would then take them out on the weekend and try to fly them wherever they could. Uh, real sailplanes, not model airplanes, uh, which was great fun, but you learn by doing and learn by crashing and they have to repair and hopefully no one gets hurt. Um, they found a beach uh, north of Torrey Pines, north of Torrey Pines Cliffs, so it was nice and flat and could tow the, air, the glider behind the car with a rope and get it up into the air and come back down and land. It turned out that in February of 1930, uh, Charles Lindbergh had used a Bola sailplane on a flight from Mount Soledad in La Jolla, all along the cliffs at Torrey Pines up to a landing at Del Mar, which was at the time a distance record here locally, regionally, Western America, for the longest distance of a sailplane flight, 20, you know, a few miles, five miles at the time. Uh, and so the students were like, well, if that cliff is good enough for Lindbergh, it must be good enough for me. So they tried to launch their gliders off the beach below the cliffs. And with the rope, get off the rope, and then you try to soar in the lift of the cliff. Uh, as the wind is hitting the cliff, it has nowhere else to go but up. And if you're in a sailplane, you can fly in that lifting current uh, and soar as long as the wind is going, and then land back down on the beach. Um, that was fine. A lot of the beachgoers at the time didn't necessarily like the fact that there were these glider guys running with their cars and airplanes on the beach. They wanted to do fishing instead. And so in about 1935, 1936, Another gentleman named Woody Brown helped these younger students uh, learn how to fly off the top of the cliff and land on the top again, which was very brave because it's a 300 foot high cliff. It's very steep, as you'll see later today, maybe, uh, and um, got the courage to go do that and show that that was possible. And after that, the glider port was born uh, and flying has happened there ever since, except for the period of World War II, where it was closed uh, and converted into a U.S. Army training facility, ironically, for anti-aircraft training and also assault uh, training. Uh, and then we've had a few times where it's been closed because of things like the nearby U.S. Open golf tournament or you know, other, other events that have happened, uh, but mostly continuous flying since uh, World War II. Wow. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing that it's still active to this day. Yeah. And... Um... And at the, at the time in the 1930s, there were a lot of these kinds of facilities for gliding all up and down the coastline, just like there used to be old roller coasters up and down the coastline in California. There used to be glider sites up and down the coastline. And this site is the really the only true remaining um, site from that coastal type of ridge soaring uh, site in Western America. Wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you very much for that. And um, also, curious enough, um, I, I do think that you you may have mentioned this in in class mm. what is the dead man's pulley oh very good nice <laughs> you've researched <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of the gentlemen that grew up here in san diego a guy named john robinson uh was one of these students high school students that was flying on the beach and learning how to fly gliders on the beach at torrey pines the glider port on the top of the cliffs is a very short area to take off and land in with the glider it's not like the long beach and so in order to get a glider off the ground back in the 1930s, you would tow it behind a car. Uh, the car would go as fast as it possibly could right towards the cliff edge and stop before the cliff. Let's hope uh, the glider goes over the top, drops the rope, and can then fly. Uh, you have to have a very brave friend that's going to want to drive it like 40 or 50 miles an hour right towards a cliff. So getting the speed of the plane up to speed as fast as possible makes it easier for your friend not to have to drive so fast and be able to stop on time. So what they did was they took a stake, put the rope uh, that would be the tow rope for the plane in the ground with a stake, ran the rope through a pulley on the back of the car uh, that would give twice the speed for the glider that's then hooked up to the rope on the back for half the speed of the car, which is the most important part. So in a shorter field, you could get still the same or even twice the speed uh, and not have to drive so fast towards the cliff edge in a crazy precarious way. That same method was used for aircraft training, for glider training in World War II. Uh, that was one of the inventions that came out of the Torrey Pines glider port over time that's been really important. Uh, they're called the dead man's pulley or the auto tow pulley. Auto tow pulley. That's yeah. awesome. Yep. Very so good. That, um, this may not be included in the video, but I'm curious. Um, what's the statistics on how many people died during these crazy stunts? Wow, good question. So early on, actually not that many folks passed away. You would think maybe it's crazy for kids to be flying off mountains with gliders, but these gliders are flying pretty slowly. Uh, they're, not, they're not flying generally at very high altitudes at the beginning. And so when you're learning uh, in these kinds of gliders, yeah, you might crash, but there's probably going to be damage to the plane and not too much to you. 
uh, when the performance of the sailplanes improved uh, and they could fly higher and faster and further, then uh, you know, then there's more of a risk. Uh, there have been, of course, unfortunately, accidents, uh, not only at the Torrey Pines Fire Airport, but other locations too. Um, but they actually weren't that common early on, uh, surprisingly, and that was a good thing. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, yeah, it's 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 kind of a kind of a silly thing to call call the pulley the dead man's pulley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get, I get it. <laughs> it's a little scary. I get it. Yeah. And then also is is another technology that that was birthed out of this this amazing location, the yeah. Robinson um, variometer. Yes, was, very good. So John Robinson, Robinson again, very fantastic, uh, inventive top pilot in America. Uh, we're very fortunate he came out of San Diego. Um, he had a plane that was called the Zenonia. The Zenonia was a very gull wing shaped plane. It's currently still exists and it's in the National Soaring Museum in New York. Um, it was a fabulous plane for its time, well advanced, uh, had a very high aspect ratio wing and had a fantastic glide ratio for every one foot that it fell down in altitude, it went 30 feet forward, which was amazing at the time. Most aircraft there were like a 20 to one ratio, this was 30 to one, so it was way ahead. Uh, and John really tuned that aircraft at Torrey Pines at the glider board, flight after flight after flight, making sure the center of gravity was right, cleaning it up as much as he possibly could, really refining it, and went out to become uh, America's first three-time national champion in the photos. Uh, also, the first pilot in the world to collect uh, what's called the Diamond Sea Badge. It's one of Soaring's highest achievement. Uh, it was, at the time, the highest achievement program. There are now higher achievement programs, but back then it was the higher one. And he was the first in the world to receive that with this same sailplane, flying to crazy altitudes of like 30,000 feet, uh, making 300 miles in the sailplane, no engine, uh, really fantastic flying. As a part of that, uh, he invented a device uh, called a, a Robinson pellet variometer, which was a device in the cockpit that allowed him to see his rate of climb or rate of descent. Now, there had been other types of variometers that had been invented before that, uh, mainly in Germany, to help tell you as a pilot, you know, are you are you lifting now or are you sinking? Sometimes it's hard to know, even though you're you're in you're flying the plane, it's hard to know. But this was a very very sensitive pellet type variometer. Had a little a little foam ball that would go up or down, uh, and based on that, he was able to like eke out as much lift as possible out of the air, even if it was a tiny amount of lift. He would know uh, a little bit more efficiently than other people using older variometer types. And that variometer was test flown at Torrey Pines. He set up a company to start selling those. Every variometer he sold was tested at Torrey Pines in a sailplane to verify it was doing the same as the one he had, uh, and then he'd go sell it. So uh, he did really well with that. So yeah, that's, that's amazing. Great, grateful to have him come out of uh, oh, Southern yeah. California. San Diego High School. The Bear Flag Republic. Oh, it's the same high school as you, did you say? Oh, San Diego High School. Oh. oh, oh. I, I was a graduate of La Jolla High School, uh, but he was oh, San Diego. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. Yep. Um, fellow fellow bear flag Republican over there. There you go. There you go. <laughs> and um, the um, my my final question is kind of broad. I want you yeah. to I want you to um answer it however you wish, but there seems to be a lot of information about Torrey Pines Airport and its great accomplishments from ancient history in the 1800s until up until like maybe the 1960s ish, but anything after that, there doesn't seem to be too many accomplishments. Are there any notable figures that came out of oh, Torrey yeah. Pines after yeah, yeah. the 1960s? Oh, fantastic. So, so part of that answer that I have to say is that when I was doing the research for the, the history, uh, in order to get a site preserved as a historic site, there's a period of time. You can't like, you can't say it's up to now and call it be historic. It has to be like 50 years or whatever. I forget what the time frame, but it had to be like in the past. So I did my research up to that point and I, I kind of stopped because I ran out of time. Uh, surely there are plenty of people that should be recognized between, let's say, 1950 and now even that have done some amazing things at Torrey Pines. Um, so, for instance, uh, the first four world records for hang gliding endurance were set at Torrey Pines. A first one hour flight, first two hour flight, first three hour flight, and almost four hour flight of hang gliding. So there's been a, an amazing amount of, of growth in the sport of hang gliding at Torrey Pines. It was from the 1970s on. Uh, there's a new, relatively new uh, aspect of that kind of ultralight uh, sport called paragliding that came into the vogue in Torrey Pines in about 1989. But in Crest, there's also a whole growth of, of 
of uh, instruction and people coming out of paragliding for Tory Pines that have done amazing things on paragliding. And then there's been radio controlled soaring uh, since about 1950 at Tory Pines. Uh, there's been some amazing people who have done great things in RC soaring that are now teaching, that are using model aircraft in new ways for unmanned aircraft um, and new designs that have been tested at Tory Pines as kind of like an outdoor wind tunnel uh, to try new things with radio control so that no one gets hurt. Um, and in addition to that, um, there have been other sailplane pilots that have still done amazing things from 1950 to late to recent times. Uh, one of them was a lady named Helen Dick, who is also from San Diego. She, just like Johnny Robinson, she was the first woman to achieve a diamond sea uh, in America, and she's a San Diego product. Uh, there's been lots of those kinds of things that have happened with Torrey Pines being kind of like a testing ground or a training ground for them to then go out and do their accomplishments later on. I see. All right. Thank you very much. Um, that's about it. Thank you very much for your for your great um, insight into this no this problem. world. Man, I hope you have a good time at the glider port. All right. Thank you. See you. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs>